I know that you find badminton riveting. I had no idea that badminton could become such a source of controversy. But in the 2012 London Olympics, it was. And the punishment that came toward eight female athletes was beyond their expectation because in the badminton doubles for women, the anticipation is getting to you, I know. Even the sound system was like, what? Listen to this. Disqualified from any medal contention for conducting oneself in a manner that is clearly abusive or detrimental to the sport. So let me tell you what happened. In the quarterfinal round of the women's doubles badminton bracket, four teams decided to throw the match that they were in in order to try to game who they would face in the next round. And so they purposefully played far below their potential to fix the match. And it became so laughable that these incredible Olympians, I know you follow badminton closely, they're the best of the best, they were taking the birdie or the shuttlecock and they were purposely serving it out of bounds. And it got to this point so much that the crowd began to whistle and jeer and boo. It was probably the most ruckus badminton event you could ever imagine. You can actually go online and, and watch the match, and it shows online the peak of volume. Have you guys seen that? It's like grayed on the progress bar of a, of a YouTube video. It'll show you uh, when, when most people have watched. And so if you just follow the spikes, you can put that. Don't do it right now. <laughs> but you can watch it, and you can actually see these incredible athletes throwing the match. And they thought they'd get away with it, but what ended up happening is they, they caused self-sabotage. And while they were Olympians, they were prohibited from receiving their reward. They never lost their status as the athletes that they were, but they were disqualified. A very similar dynamic is happening in the book of Hebrews as we come into Hebrews chapter 6. I'd like to ask that you join me in the book of Hebrews. It's found in the New Testament. We're going to be starting in chapter 6. We're going to cover verses 1 through 8 today. And like these athletes from Indonesia, two teams from South Korea and China, uh, we're going to find that uh, there's a warning that we need to heed we're not talking about badminton, but I believe we could all agree that what they did was quite a racket. <laughs> quite, <laughs> quite a racket. Hey, why don't we read the Bible? Doesn't that sound better than listening to uh, jokes? Okay. Now, Trey introduced this section that began last week in chapter 5, starting in verse 11. And so this section will go through verse 12, and we're going to be covering this over the next couple of weeks, but our passage will begin in Hebrews 6, starting in verse 1, and I'm going to read through verse 8. The Bible says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that has often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, 
and its end is to be burned. May God bless his word as we read it and hear it and walk through it. So I want to take this passage in three sections, and I just have one word per section to try to keep this as clear and as simple as I can. And, and the, the verses break down in verses 1 to 3, 4 to 6, and 7 to 8. And so we have instruction, warning, and illustration. Say those words with me. Ready? Instruction, warning, and illustration. Okay? So we will have a, a word of instruction that starts this text, and then a very severe warning. This is actually one of five warnings that are found in the book of Hebrews. This is the third warning that we've covered up to this point. And so we'll, we will take a special look at that and some of the intricacies of understanding that passage. And then finally, there will be an illustration that the writer of Hebrews uses to help clarify for the audience what is at stake. So, we need to start with the first section of instruction. And this, again, is chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. It says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings and the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. There's a question that we need to ask right from the beginning because there's a call for us to leave something. The writer is saying, let us, based off what has been shared before, which Trey said we need to have a serious view of sin and a high view of Jesus Christ as our great high priest. Therefore, there's something that we are to depart. And it says, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. Now, this does not mean let us abandon our belief in Christ, but this is a call to we need to grow from here. We need to move on from the basic things to go into deeper or things of greater maturity. So what are the elementary doctrines of Christ? Well, they're laid out in the passage in three couplets. So two ideas are paired together and, and, they, and they have this connection. And the first pairing is about internal doctrine. These are the internal elementary doctrines that relate to Jesus. And the text says that there's repentance from dead works and faith toward God. What this elementary doctrine teaches is that for you to be saved, you must turn away from your sin and trust in what Jesus has uniquely done for you. He is the Son of God who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. I was talking with a young man just before this service, and he was, we were talking about the idea of communion. And we we're going to celebrate communion at the end of our service today. And he wanted to know, well, why do we take that? What is that about? Is, this, is it the same as the Passover? And we got into this conversation about what Jesus did. And the reason why we celebrate communion is because we believe it is a symbol that represents what Christ uniquely did as our Savior. Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. We are to move away from our effort to try to earn our way to God and yield our hearts to Jesus. We are to trust and believe that Jesus died for us and he rose from the dead and that our faith in him is what brings our salvation. So the internal doctrine is this is a matter of the heart and of the mind inside. What do you believe about Jesus? This is essential. This is important. This is basic, integral to what it means to be Christian. So this internal doctrine is that we repent from the works that cannot save us and we have faith and trust in what God has revealed in Jesus. Second is the external doctrines. These are practices that especially would have had value and meaning to a Jew, people of a Jewish background. People who had a Jewish background who come out of that religion, there were a series of ceremonial washings that were extremely important to them. And so this idea about inst instruction about washings is it was elementary for these Jews who have come out of their Judaism and into faith in Jesus as Christians now to be corrected on what cleanses them. Do external washings cleanse people of their sin, church? 
No, absolutely not. It's only the shed blood of Jesus Christ that washes us whiter than snow. And they had to be taught this. They had to move away from the practices that they once defined themselves by to move into uh, following Jesus and trusting in what he has uniquely accomplished. And the only washing that there was for Christians to partake in was baptism, which again did not save them or cleanse them of their sins, but it was in response to what Jesus has done. The laying on of hands was also the blessing of God, and this was a practice that we find in the book of Acts over and over, especially in Jewish contexts. When the gospel came to people, they would be blessed after receiving Christ as their Savior, and there would be a laying of the hands on them. So this was external practices or external doctrines. We had internal, which was faith in Christ. External was moving away from trying to do external practices for cleansing. But then there's also a category of future doctrine. And this is the idea of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment that's to come. Now, we might look at that and go, I don't know that that's elementary for me. We're going to be raised to new life. There's going to be judgment of God that's going to come against those who do not believe in him and then judgments that stand for those of us who do believe in him. For the writer of Hebrews, he's saying, look, y'all, this is basic stuff. This is Christianity 101. It's kind of an indication to me of I've got a lot more growing to do. He's saying that there are elementary beliefs of Jesus that like for badminton players, the elementary ideas would be this is a racket. Or the great Vince Lombardi, uh, over the, his halftime speech, you guys may know this, his team that were getting beat, and I love it anytime the Packers get beat, but they were, they were struggling, and at halftime, he held up a football, and do you know the line? He said, gentlemen, this is a football. And he was bringing them back to the basics because they had forgotten the rudimentary skills And they were getting beat off the line and they were getting crushed. I wish it was the bears that were crushing them. I don't think it was. But you're with me, right? Essential and elementary to our Christian faith that we believe and trust in Jesus Christ. We step away from anything that once we thought could cleanse us of our sin. Only Jesus does that. And there is a certainty of a resurrection hope for all who are in Christ because Jesus rose from the grave. And there will definitely be future judgment. So this text, let's look at it again. It says, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. Now, this, for me, was the biggest aha of the entire passage of verses 1 to 8. And is going to link together things that I believe help us better interpret what what is happening here in the text. And it's this. The leaving of elementary doctrine is tied to an active decision on the part of the believer, but it is the first half of the instruction. There is something to leave, and there's something to pursue. And it says, and go on to maturity. But the big aha for me is what was an active call with the first command. It is a passive call in the second command. And what that means is that, yes, we are to leave the elementary basics, but if it is a passive command, then it is be carried into maturity. That moves the responsibility of maturity off of the believer. We are not in control of our own spiritual maturing process. We are carried into maturity, but we can hinder it. We have responsibility for things to say no to and to leave and things that we are to pursue, but we are carried into maturity by someone else. And that someone else is revealed in verse 3. And I will tell you, verse 3 is the most important verse in verses 1 through 8, yet it is the most overlooked. It is simple. It is clear. The rest of the passage is less simple and less clear. 
But look at verse 3. Read it with me out loud. And this we will do if God permits. You see, we're called into a passive command. Be carried into maturity. That is important. Verse 3 says this is going to happen. We will do this. We will move on from the elementary things and we will go on to maturity. This will happen if God permits. Because he is the one who brings the fruit from our lives. He is the one who molds us into the image of Jesus. He is the one who transforms us. And he is the one who molds and matures us. We will experience this should he permit. And this then leads into a section of warning. But again, this first section of instruction... A simple statement, we mature as God permits. Are you with me? We mature as God permits. Now let's read through verses 4 through 6, and this is our warning. We start with the word for. So the case that has just been made, here's a rationale for that case. For it is impossible In the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Now, this set of verses is extremely challenging. One of the things that makes it challenging is it is a very long and complicated sentence. In fact, the subject of the sentence doesn't even show up until verse 6. And it's a pairing together of participles. We are going to talk a little bit about some grammar because it's very important. So we're going to... uh, Uh, dive in. But first, I want to share some values that I have that I believe we all should have when it comes to dealing with difficult texts. Because this is highly debated. So here are my values that I bring and seek to pursue when trying to understand a difficult passage. First is humility. We are not right all the time. Honesty We all have a theological bias. I I wish I could say that I, I just come to the Word of God every time I read it without any bias at all. No, I've been shaped by my education, my background, the denomination I was raised in. All these different aspects have shaped and created a theological bias, a lens through which I see Scripture. And we have to be honest that We all have a theological bias, and we all have to be honest that our theological bias is not perfect. Third value, Bible over bias. So even though I have my own theological bias or biases, I have to submit to the the Word of God. And anytime we're dealing with something that is challenging, We cannot assume that our theological grid means that we're going to be right. But we have to take a look at Scripture and see what Scripture says and then yield to the biblical context. Fourthly, grace. We are in a big theological sandbox. We have brothers and sisters who see this passage differently. All who are brilliant, all who know Uh, Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, those who study the scriptures. We have brothers and sisters that see this from a variety of perspectives, even those who we would say are brothers and sisters in Christ, yet we believe are in biblical error. And so we must have grace, and that is extremely lacking within the church when it comes to theological debate. Got to be gracious. And then, doctrine circles. We need to know our circles. And this image will help you understand what I mean. 
there are beliefs that we hold that are true. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is fully God. He is fully man. He really died. He really was buried and he really rose from the dead. That is the truth. There is no name given to man under heaven by which we are saved except the name of Jesus Christ. His name is true. He's the second person of the Trinity. There is a first person of the Trinity, God the Father, and there's a third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. This is true and we hold it with clenched fist. It is true. The word of God is our authority. It is true. It is objective truth. It came from outside of us. It is not subject to my opinion. It is true. And we call people into membership here at Tomball Bible Church. We talk about what are the essential truths to believe. There's like seven Outside of that, then there are things that we grip, perhaps not with clenched fists, that this is true, but we hang on to because we have a conviction. It is true, Jesus Christ will return to judge the, the living and the dead. Amen. The manner in which he will return is not this, y'all, but it is conviction. We have a conviction about the manner in which Jesus will return based off a theological grid that we interpret the Scriptures. It is a conviction. (coughs) And then there is opinion that my dog Rosie Jane will be in heaven, right? There's opinion. There are things that we come to that we go, perhaps. And so we need to know where our doctrinal circles are and then to understand what we're dealing with in the text. What I can tell you is what we're about to explore is a matter of conviction. A matter of conviction. Because what I will show and aim and endeavor to show is that there are a couple of interpretations that are biblically accurate and true. But if I do this and someone across the aisle does this too, then maybe, I don't know what all that meant. Okay. (laughs) That was not, that was not planned. All right. Let's stick to what was planned. All right. So In order to best understand this, we have to answer two questions. We have to answer, first of all, who does the author have in mind? Who does the author have in mind? So let's look at the people that are being described. Here are the words that describe them. First of all, it says they've been enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They've shared in the Holy Spirit. They've tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. And they have fallen away. These are the conditions of our subject of this sentence. They've been enlightened, they've tasted, they've shared, they've tasted, and they've fallen away. Now, a comment on this first one of, they, of having been enlightened. We've already talked about this idea of a passive experience. And this is a passive experience for these people. They have received enlightening. They did not themselves become enlightened as if they... Uh, meditated their way into nirvana. This was something that was brought upon their understanding. The Lord caused the lights to come on. They were enlightened. They tasted the heavenly gift. This idea of heavenly gift, uh, the word gift used in the New Testament always applies to spiritual gifts. The the God-given abilities given to the church to represent him in the world. So that's most likely what they're uh, describing, what's being described here. So they've tasted in having spiritual gifts. They've shared in the Holy Spirit. They've tasted the goodness of God's word and the powers or the miracles of the age to come. And 
they have fallen away. So we have to take these terms and we have to say and answer the question, who's in mind? <clears throat> well, first, there's two options for the who. It's either unbelievers are being referred to here or believers are being referred to here. We have to make a decision about who's being talked about. They're either unbelievers or they're believers. And there are, as we move forward, please understand, all of these views are held by people we will see in heaven. Okay. So if you hold the view of unbelievers, here are some of the views that, that take this approach. First of all, they are seen as unbelievers who may profess faith but are not genuine believers. This is called the test of genuineness view. Is it biblically true that there may be people in churches that actually don't believe in Jesus? But they think that they're okay because they're attending church, they're giving the offering, they're doing acts of service. Is it biblically accurate to think you're saved and not really be saved at all? That is true. If you have the understanding that you are pleasing God because of your church attendance record and how much you give to, uh, to mission work or whatever, you're placing your trust in yourself, which according to what is elementary doctrine, we cannot be saved by our own works. We repent from dead works and we have faith in what God has revealed. So there's a view that who's being referred to are people who have sampled what it's like to be in the church. They have been blessed by being amidst the, the people of God. And this is a widely held view, widely held view. Next, uh, it could be, if they're unbelievers, warnings help preserve genuine believers. This is called the means of salvation. The idea here is that a warning that is, that is a genuine warning serves to help preserve the salvation of God's people. I'll try to say it in, in two illustrations. One would be the edge of the Grand Canyon. If you go to the Grand Canyon, there are going to be posted signs that say, warning, do not go over the edge. Why? You're going to die. So the warning sign helps to prevent the outcome. But you're not going to do that. Second illustration. There is the truth that God... Who saves us? Do we save ourselves or does God save us? God saves us. But are we involved in that process? Is it true that if we do not believe in God, if what he has, believed, if what he has revealed about Jesus... Will we perish? If we do not believe in Jesus, will we go to hell? Yes. But does God save us? So we have two sides of the same coin. God saves us. We believe. If we do not believe, we will suffer. Are we called to go on to maturity? Yes. If we fall away, we might get destroyed. That is the perspective of these who hold this view. That that warning helps to preserve us. And God uses both. Or there is a hypothetical view. And this is an argument that says that believers, hypothetically speaking, could lose their salvation. If fall away means fall away from faith in Jesus. But God won't let you do this. So it's a hypothetical argument that... Um, is, is found there. Now I want you to, to see that these views interpret of an important word. It's called parapassantus. It is the, it's the word that means have fallen away. It's, it's the last descriptor of this group of people and the meaning of this passage and the second question that we'll answer is what does that mean? And we will get there. But we talked about the, the unbelievers you can be called my friend if you hold those views. 
And you can look at different scriptures that affirm that, the, the, those perspectives. Now, if these are believers, the first view is that genuine believers can fall out of saving grace by rejecting Christ. This is the loss of salvation view, and this is widely held by those who come out of a Nazarene background, a Methodist background. This view also interprets parapasantis as by the traditional meaning of apostasy, just like those of the, that view it as pertaining to unbelievers. But of all the views that are held by people I will see in heaven, this is the view that we at TBC would reject outright. We believe that the clear teaching from the New Testament is that believers are eternally secure in their relationship with Jesus and that this is an error that is held by brothers and sisters who believe in Jesus as well. But we do not believe it is the right teaching of the Scriptures because we believe that if you are a genuine believer in Jesus Christ, you are held and kept secure in Christ. So we reject this view. So then there's another view that if this is believers in mind, that genuine believers are hardened by God due to unrepentant sin. This is called the loss of rewards view. This view interprets parapasantis by meaning a different meaning. Meaning unrepentant, willful sin. This is tied to the idea that's found like in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, where there will be judgment that God will give on believers based off works done in righteousness or in unrighteousness. That the works that we do that are done with unrighteous motives will be burned away and will not receive any reward. We're told about this judgment in Romans 14, verses 10 to 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. So there's a lot that hangs in the balance on what does this word parapasantus mean. And this brings us to our next slide. We have two options for what that means. What does have fallen away? Does have fallen away mean apostasy, which traditionally is defined as falling away from genuine faith? So it's either yes or no. So it's kind of clear the who is either they're unbelievers or they're believers. We've got to decide. But then on this, we have to decide, is it yes, falling away means genuine apostasy, falling out of genuine faith, or no, that it means they have fallen into unrepentant, willful sin. You have to decide. So I want to share with you the preferred, the preferred meanings that, that the preaching team has here at TBC, and, uh, and then I will share what my preferred view is in that as well. So here are the two preferred meanings that we take to this text. One, the test of genuineness view. This is going to be held by people such as John Piper, Charles Spurgeon, smart dudes, they love Jesus. They know more scripture. They'll forget more scripture than I may ever learn. And they hold this view in conviction. You might include, I think, uh, John MacArthur or Johnny Mac, however you might prefer to look at him. There are many scholarly pastors and theologians who hold this view. They view that unbelievers are the primary audience in mind, and they take apostasy to mean fall away from genuine faith. Second view, the loss of rewards view. This is my preferred meaning. And I want to make the case for it, but I want to remind you, I'm coming from the standpoint of this, not this. I don't think it would be wise to engage Charles Spurgeon in debate, but let's just look at this. 
So the loss or rewards view would answer the first question, who, who is in mind? And it would be believers are in mind. The second question is, what does have fallen away mean? And I'm going to argue that the word to fall away means to be in willful, open rebellion against God. First of all, the context is about God permitting spiritual maturity. This helps drive for me the meaning that the audience in mind that's being called into, that the writer himself says, let us, let us leave elementary practices and go on or be carried on into maturity can only apply to those of genuine faith in Jesus. They're the only ones who can actually experience spiritual maturity. If you reject Jesus Christ and do not have faith in him, God cannot permit that person to grow spiritually. Secondly, and I mentioned this, the author identifies himself with the audience by saying, let us. Okay, this word peripasantus, to mean have fallen away. This is a hard word to interpret because it is only found once in the New Testament. So you're not able to go, well, how's the word used in the rest of the book of Hebrews? Well, it's not there. Well, then how's the word used in, in, in the rest of the New Testament? It's not there. However, there is a Greek, an ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament. And there are seven uses of that Greek term that are found in the Old Testament. And in every instance, especially the five found in Ezekiel, chapter 14, verse 13, chapter 15, verse 8, chapter 18, verse 24, chapter 20, verse 27, and chapter, two, or chapter 22, verse 4, it means to act treacherously or to be an open, rebellious sin. In all extra-biblical literature of the first century, there is not a use of parapasantus to mean fall away from faith. So those who take that interpretation, we don't find the Greek word for apostasy used. That's where we get our word apostasy is from a Greek term. It's a bit of an argument from silence, but we don't know why. If it's not apostasy, or if it is apostasy, why did not the writer use that word? Instead, he chose a word or was inspired to write a word that in its other uses is not found to mean fall away from faith, but means to fall away into rebellion. There's Old Testament background as well that we've, we've talked about, about Numbers 14, this is when the people rejected the promise of God. They were supposed to trust God that he was calling them into the land of Canaan, the land of promise. They sent 12 spies in. 10 came back, said, we can't do this. There's no way. Two said, we should trust God and we can do this. And the people rejected God, rejected Moses, and they said, we're not going to go. And it cost them severely. Interestingly, in Numbers chapter 14, verse 20 to 22, Moses has interceded for the people and God says, I will forgive their iniquity. I will forgive them, but they will not be permitted to go on. The people re were rebelled. They were forgiven, but they were not permitted to enter the promised land. Even Moses himself defied God openly, publicly. And while he was forgiven by God, the greatest figure in the entire Old Testament, humanly speaking, was not allowed to go into reward. Finally, one cannot be renewed to a state they never had in the first place. The passage says it is impossible for them to be renewed to repentance. That would imply that they had repented previously. You cannot be renewed into something you never had. Now, I will tell you that I'm making a case for this, but John Piper has a good debate, as does Wayne Grudem, a 76-page paper as to why I'm wrong. So I invite you and welcome you into this debate. But my friends, 
The last thing I wanted for this morning is for us to be caught up in confusion of complication, but to hear what the author is saying. There is a spiritual maturity that the church is called into, and it is God who permits it. And if the implication is for the unbeliever, if you do not heed the call, that if you are in and amongst the church and you think that just by being here, you are good with God, you're not. There is no amount of good, righteous deeds you can do on your own which can save you and preserve your soul. So this is a call to anyone here that if you think you get to God by looking the part of a Christian, you will suffer judgment. And that judgment is eternal separation from God forever, suffering in hell. Now, I don't want this to drum up some kind of unfounded fear or doubt. It is a sobering question. But my friends, if you believe that Jesus is the one who did the work, if you believe that Jesus is the one who paid the price for you, and your trust is in him, then you can know that you know that you know that Jesus was enough to save you. I want to read this passage again. It says, It's impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm, holding him up to contempt. Let me be clear. This is about high-handed, boastful, unrepentant sin toward God. This is not you struggling with sins that easily entangle you. If you are someone like me, that you get tripped up by sin, that you, when you're confronted or when there's conviction from the Holy Spirit, you come back to the Lord and you confess your sin and you find that he's faithful and just to forgive your sin and purify you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's a promise and a guarantee that we have in 1 John 1, 9. This is referring to the kind of rebellion where you don't care anymore. This is kind of a shaking your fist at God kind of place. And there's a danger that if we go there, if we are so hardened by sin that we no longer care about repentance, it is true that God may not permit you to ever repent from that. And you will lose out both in this life, in fruitfulness, in influence, in peace, as well as the life to come. And I think one of the reasons why it's so hard for people to engage the loss of rewards is we really don't understand what the judgment of rewards is going to be because after all, if you're in Jesus, do you get to be saved? The answer is yes. Well, that sounds pretty good to me. And I don't know with great clarity the exact ins and outs of the degrees of reward in the kingdom of God, but the scripture teaches that it's true. There will be roles of authority and of responsibility that are given to those who have been the most faithful. Particularly those who are who? The martyrs. People who have given their lives for what's true. I think the widow who gave everything that she had will probably have a pretty big role in the kingdom of God. Simple faithfulness. People without a platform will be the ones who are greatest in the kingdom of God. But I don't know that we really have a great understanding of that. And so it can feel like this award, this warning doesn't necessarily have teeth, but it does. Because God will not allow repentance for holding Christ up to contempt. He will not allow repentance for those who hold his son in contempt. Or in other words, 
conducting oneself in a manner that is clearly abusive or detrimental, not to their sport, but to the name of Christ. So then an illustration is given in this third section. So we've had instruction, we've had warning, and now we have illustration. There's a singular image that's used, and the singular image is land. Verse 7, for land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those whose forsake it is cultivated, for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it, the land, bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned." My view that I'm presenting today is that the land represents the believer. And we're talking about the fruit of sanctification, not salvation. The land, I believe, refers to genuine believers. And there's something that can be born out of our lives. And that is a very fruitful life. But if it is not a life that is centered on Jesus but has become hardened by sin's uh, process of moving you further and further away from a heart of repentance, your life will not bear godly fruit and cannot be rewarded, particularly if you hold Jesus in public contempt. So this area of illustration indicates this, the fruit of our lives reveals our God-permitted maturity. The fruit of our lives reveal, reveals our God-permitted maturity. Okay. So as a result of this, here are some concluding statements. First, we must place our faith and trust in Christ alone. That is a clear result of this text. And my hope is that everyone in here has moved away from dead works, even if they look really good, to trust in what Jesus did uniquely for us. We never need to fear the loss of our salvation. There are many people who wrestle with doubts, but you do not have to be afraid that you will be kicked out of God's family because he holds you secure. In him, we've received the Holy Spirit who's the deposit guaranteeing what's to come. We have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. As Trey called us to last week, as a result of this, we take sin seriously and hold a high view of Christ. Sin is not stagnant in our lives. It deteriorates the heart. And we must take it seriously, being quick to have godly sorrow over our sin, to repent and turn from it and hold a high view of Jesus. A result of this is we leave final judgment of others to God. It is common that when we read a text like this, there are people that we have in mind. People that we once believed wholeheartedly, they seem to have followed Jesus but we look at the state of their life now and it's like it doesn't look like they have a heart for Jesus at all. What do you do with that? Well, we first of all, we leave final judgment up to God. But if someone's life is not looking like Christ, then our responsibility is to call them back to Jesus. Not to make judgments. Well, they once were saved, but I guess they're not. So we leave final judgment of others to God. And we mature as God permits. And this is really what I want to land this morning. We mature as God permits. We have an important part in our spiritual maturity. Every believer in Christ is to walk in faithful obedience. This obedience is grounded in an abiding love for God that is revealed in godly sorrow over sin devotion to God through knowing the scriptures, using our spiritual gifts, sharing in biblical community, and telling others the good news of Jesus Christ. But the greater role in our spiritual maturity belongs to God. He is the one who carries us into deeper faith, 
hope, and love. And we can be sure he will absolutely mature, reward, and bless those whose hearts remain humble and repentant. The fact that God's present and future blessing will be given and taken away should be the very thing that motivates every believer to follow the Apostle Paul's aim in Philippians 3.14, which says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. By God's grace, we will not be disqualified from the reward. Those badminton players, they're Olympians forever. But they got in their own way and lost the very thing they thought that they had trained for to win. May that never be true of us.